I came into stupid, I'm going to have to stop and think for a second now. Um, oh yeah, I was uh, I was going to the Human Institute with Hussein Chung and encounter groups and uh, and Reynolds Bean and Harris Clemis and this was held. A lot of it was held right at the, where we were doing Lottie Hunt as well. And um, so I kept going to those meetings. But to me, it seemed like the real secret was whatever else was happening when the, when the uh, encounter groups weren't happening. So that was, uh, you know, I just thought that Lottie Hunt was the secret sauce. That was, that was the main subject. And so um, that's why I wanted to get open. And I, knew, I remember another thing that one time I, I, I walked by uh, another area where the Lottie Hunt was being held. It was like being held at a church. And I walked by and I didn't know what it was. But the minute I heard it, I said, what is that? Oh my God. And I mean, it really, it really called me. So that's when I got opened. So that was the summer after I, okay, I went to Stanford to get my teaching credential. So it was in Palo Alto. And right after that, I got opened. I was opened along uh, the same time as uh, Halima Martin and Halima Polk. Mm -hmm. And we were all at that program together at that um, thing getting master's degrees. So that's when I got opened, 67, I think. Were you opened uh, in Palo Alto or somewhere else? I was opened in Santa Monica. Santa Monica. I, yeah, because I hadn't been, I heard Buffa was coming. I hadn't, I'd only been probationing for about six weeks. I remember that I went to, so I got there. I found out where the meeting was. It was downstairs. And so Buffa was giving a talk. And I thought, great, I guess I'll just go on in. I hadn't been opened yet. And I was sitting next to, I think, Halima Martin. And I, I got a little, little tap on my shoulder saying, um, you know what, honey, you're really not supposed to be here yet because you're not opened. <laughs> but I think that it, uh, somebody had me sit down right next to her. It might have been Rasuna Donovan. And that's who opened me. I got open that afternoon, so then I, then it was all kosher. So do you remember much about your early experiences in the Lottie Hunt? I, uh, yeah, my very earliest experiences was crying all the time. And then I slept. That was my, those first Lottie Hans were like that. Um, the other thing I remember was I went right back from that to teaching uh, English at Pacific Grove High School. And from that summer, I was determined to shake everything up and teach the way I really ought to be teaching so that I really reached the kids. I was teaching English and made it something real for them. I actually did one one group of kids that were uh, mostly in sports, uh, and I couldn't uh, I couldn't I, it was like during the same period I'll try to tell this story more quickly. It was the same period as as lunch. So lunch was going on outside. They were sports kids. They weren't interested in any of this. But I I, uh, I actually invited Peter and Margie Smart to come and run a psychodrama. <laughs> as part of the class and they pick some kids and put them on the spot and the whole kind of a thing. And those were some kind of tough kids, you know? And then after all that happened, I told them, okay, here's your English assignment. Write me, write a thing about what just happened. I don't care about the spelling. I don't care about the punctuation, just write it all down. And so I got them to write an essay, which they ordinarily would not do. And, and that's the kind of thing that I was trying to do. Well, what happened was I was able to do this for about three months. 
But the trouble was I had just been opened and I was feeling the Latihan all the time. And they kids, the kids thought I was stoned. So <laughs> one time I was walking along and there's some kids, you know, it must have been like lunchtime or something where people weren't in classes. And I overheard them say, there she goes again, stoned out of her mind. And I wasn't doing any drugs at all, but I was pretty spacey. Mm. And, uh, and then what happened was, uh, I guess sometime around Thanksgiving break, I started to be really messed up. So I went to see a psychologist and I told him what I was going through. And, uh, and he just had me talk. And at the end of that, I said, well, you know, I don't think coming here a couple of times a week or a month or whatever is actually going to help. So I really don't know what to do. So then I drove home and I was in this little old house in Monterey that was kind of a, an old Italian neighborhood. And I was living in this house all by myself. And I had been feeling uh, spirits that weren't happy with me there. And uh, and then when I would try to sleep at night, I felt something pushing down on the pillow. In other words, I was I was getting a little nutty. Well, I came home. It was almost dark. I uh, I turned on the lights, and all the lights blew out. And that was it. I left. I never went back there. I got in my car. I spent the night on Fisherman's Wharf. I drove home. I drove back to my parents' house, and I quit. I stopped teaching. The fun thing is, is that that one class, that one class, the way we were running that class is we sat in a circle and the kids talked about what they, what they wanted to talk about and what meant something to them. <laughs> they, they actually went, they, they, got, they got in the class before the substitute got there, the door was locked. Some of the kids climbed over the transom and got in the room. And they all sat around in a circle and they told the sub where to sit. And then they continued class. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that was satisfying. Anyway, so after that, I moved to Palo Alto and because uh, I had been in Pacific Grove and I just started coming to Lottie Hunt. So, oh yeah. And I, I worked at Bob's Home of the Big Boy Hamburger after that and a whiskey bottling factory. And there I was with my master's degree from Stanford, uh, serving Stanford students at Bob's home of the big boy, but whatever. <laughs> well, how did, uh, <clears throat> how was the, the psychodrama and the thing going on? Was that at the same time or earlier or what? The psychodrama happened, um, at the same time, and that is where I decided that I needed to be in Subud. And then what happened was, um, I think it was a little after that, a bunch of us, a whole bunch of the Human Institute went to, it might have been the same summer, I don't remember. The whole human, all the, a whole bunch of us showed up in Santa Monica. I think it was a, a different time, but I'm not sure about that. And we heard that, um, the Papa called Hussein Chum upstairs to talk to him and told him that um, psychodrama was okay, but once people were open, they shouldn't come to it anymore. Well, that got a, uh, so this humanist who crowd was up in arms. The, the, you know, the man is after us again. You know what I mean? There, you know, it, it's like, yeah. And so they were, they had a big powwow out on the lawn and all that kind of stuff. But um, so after that, I tried once to go to, I, so I stopped going to psychodrama and just did Lottie Hunt instead. But I tried once to, uh, to, to, to go to it. And it was so interesting because Hussein ran this whole group. And then uh, after most of it was done, he just kind of, uh, he kind of poo-pooed it and said he was just like, I mean, you could see that he was manipulating people. Here's what I, 
my and God bless everybody. I, I don't mean to be critical or to make people sad who might not like what I'm saying, but what was happening was um, it was turning into a power trip and, and it was not so much about the people, but about having power over over people and it was getting to be um, inappropriate. So I didn't go back anymore. But that was the end of that. So I would say that it was happening simultaneously, but then um, there started to be a split. So that's that. And so it eventually ended, I think, at some point, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so then eventually maybe some people um, might have stopped going to Lottie Hunt and kept on doing the psychodrama. Some people might have tried to do both. I don't know. There was one really interesting time. There was a five-day marathon in Burlingame. Five days. Can you imagine? Oh, my God. And it was so interesting because on the fourth night, there was a guy who was a taxi driver from New York City, and he was Muslim. And we couldn't figure out why he was there. He didn't ever do any of the psychodrama or anything like that. And then there was this scene where, um, for once, Hussein was in the middle of the circle, and he was talking to that guy. And uh, all of a sudden, the guy smacked him. And he he was telling him that um, you can't play God, basically, is what he was saying, you know, that this is what's happening here isn't isn't uh, isn't appropriate. It's not good. And then Hussein, he really is apt to Hussein. And uh, it was pretty amazing. Uh, I, I think that was a powerful thing. And um, and we had a lot of respect for that guy who uh, had been actually going out and doing his his Muslim prayers throughout the weekend. Hmm. But I, I'm not even sure it's appropriate for me to talk about this because it's other people's changes. But that was very interesting. Yeah. So later on, you progressed in Subud and uh... How did you and Sharif get together? <laughs> well, I uh, I wanted to be married. I was like, maybe I was 24, something like that. Maybe a little older. And so I started fasting on Monday and Thursdays for a husband. I did this for quite a while. And uh, and then, uh, then I, I stopped fasting for any reason at all, because I was afraid I would get a husband. It seemed like sort of a scary proposition. So uh, <laughs> anyway, um, so the other thing that would happen now at this point, I was, uh, was I in Pacific Grove? I don't know. But the main thing was, uh, as I was trying to go to sleep at night, I would feel somebody holding me. And that was nice and interesting a little weird and uh at one time i woke up in the morning and kissed the pillow good morning and i'm thinking okay kiddo <laughs> what is going on with you and then i started getting these letters from sharif because he had seen me at a congress and his what he would do he would send me a postcard with a picture of an eye on it that's it and his name so what the heck? So I thought the guy was kind of, he got hit by a train because he had gotten hit by a train in Skymont and he was recovering. I thought it's, you know, he's he's a little bit touched or something. But anyway, he, then he started writing letters and he's, he uh, he just said, well, there's a there's a Subud meeting in Albuquerque and uh, how brave are you? And how well can you get to know somebody in a letter? So I thought, uh oh, he wants, he just invited me to come to the Congress, which of course he didn't, but that's not what I thought. So I, I, uh, I showed up at the Congress <laughs> and he was mildly terrified, um, but that's okay. So uh, this was really something. So um, he, uh, 
we were going to spend the, we were going to stay in his van because he didn't have a room. And then uh, they're very sweet, Harlan McWillis and somebody else. They decided to room together, two helpers, I think. And they gave us their room. And so I said, oh yeah, here was the other thing. When I was preparing to go, I said, okay, Sofiati, if you think this is the person you're gonna marry, that you're supposed to marry him, go with it, trust him, don't hold back, just do what you feel is the right thing to do. Let's not mess this up. I think I was already 27. So anyway, um, so, here I was, and I, by this time, was very strict. Here I was going to spend the night with somebody that I didn't barely even know. Um, but I thought, okay, that's all right. So there was two beds. That was fine. I went to bed early with a headache. Sharif came back much later. And when I woke him up in the morning, because to go to breakfast, he asked me to marry him. And then I said, yes. So... <laughs> We tested about it that night and uh, it seemed very good. And then we got married two weeks later at the Santa Cruz Suba house. Oh, pretty yeah. fast work there. It huh? was very fast. And within a week, I was already pregnant with my first kid. <laughs> it was a crash course. And 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 we we he he started selling Indian jewelry, so we were actually living out of his van for a while. Um, and that, that got old pretty quick. So anyway, that's what happened. <laughs> so after that, you're living together, having kids. Yeah. How, how is Subud affecting your life at that point? Um, well, we were a part of the group in, in Phoenix. And that was good. Um, we still continued to have adventures, and uh, he got we got robbed. Okay, so the Indian jewelry got stolen. Things like this kept happening, and we decided to move to San Diego, and that uh, and that's where uh, that's where we lived for. A long time, maybe 20 years, and we we're very active in Subud there. And so we had a little school and all kinds of stuff like that. Yeah. Have you had any particular kind of unusual experiences, spiritual experiences in that you can recall? Very interesting things that have to do with ancestors, uh, which I've been thinking of lately since it's the month of ancestors. And um, especially my Italian grandmother, my father's mom, she was very religious. She went to, she was Catholic and she went to church every day in Brooklyn. And uh, there, there were times when I was, distressed about something and she would just kind of show up and uh give me a little give me a little talk you know one time I was very stressed about my son I worried about him all the time when he was a teenager and she kind of showed up and told me that I had luxury problems and uh you know he was going to be fine luxury problems because she she was a mom during the 1919 influenza epidemic. I think she lost a lot of children. A lot of her children died. Wow. So, you know, she kind of like was trying to set me straight about what real trouble is. Yeah. <laughs> that kind of thing. Um, uh, what else? Unusual experiences. Yeah, you know, when I was... Um, uh, when we were doing Rainbow Rock, which was our uh, tie-dye company, that was very interesting. So we had just, uh, we're trying to sell tie-dye kits. And we went, we did a lot, a lot of work on this. 
but things would happen. And then it would look like, like we would lose a big sale. Oh yeah, we did a whole big shipment and then it got sent back and I owed a whole lot of money. Mm. Um, but there always, there would be something that, that would come through and help us. It just seemed to work all right. You know, and at one point things were bad enough that I had this business advisor who told me that maybe we should quit, but I had a, a strong receiving in Lottie Hunt that um, I didn't bring you this far to leave you alone. You know, just keep, keep going. Hmm. And it turned out being very, very good. It turned out being amazing. Um, I mean, we got on, uh, we got on national television shows. We got on Aline's Creative Living a bunch of times and on QVC, we sold out. I sold out on QVC. That was quite something. Interlaced with all of that, there was things that would happen in Lottie Hunt that would give me um, hints about what to do and, and how to handle it. I remember one time, our whole packing crew was my son, Sofan, and all of his crazy friends who would come to work <laughs> on skateboards with dreads flying in the air, the pants sagging down to nowhere, and a big Slurpee in their hand. And they'd all just like come up and park all the skateboards and come in and start packing the tie-dye kits with, with the Grateful Dead blaring. And uh, <laughs> something. And, and sometimes the kids would be going through something. Like a lot of them were dropouts. They were high school dropouts. Actually, my son was too. And, um, and sometimes I'd have to manage whatever the upset was and stuff like that. And I'm thinking, uh, what kind of a business is is this anyway, honey? What, what are you doing? You call this a business? This is just a zoo. But then uh, when I got quiet, I, I received that uh, actually the real subject was the employees. The real subject was not the business. The business was just a pretext. The real work was being done working with the kids. So that was cool. And the business did fine anyway. So yeah. We finally got into Michael's. This was something else. We got into Michael's. We got into, oh my God. We got into all the Michael's stores. They started with a little one, but then we had to, and we had four trucks come and we had to, we had all these tie dye kits that we had to pack. It took a couple of months to pack them all. We also had some of them done in Mexico. And you know what? That line is still, it's not called Rainbow Rock anymore. It was bought by Duncan Enterprises and it's now sold under the Tulip line. But that was our tie-dye kit line. They just put it in new packaging and all of the ideas I had were spread out. They, they're very wise. They spread out all the ideas I had to make them last over years. And it's, it's still a big part of Michael's. You could see it, it's huge. So that's kind of cool. If I feel sad, I, I go over there and say, hey, hey, look at that. Hmm. <laughs> Interesting story. Yeah. Yeah. So many amazing things happened with that. Just crazy stuff that would happen that shouldn't uh, shouldn't have worked out like that, but it, it just all worked out. Have you had any experiences around Bopak or have you even been around Bopak very much? I had an experience once. I think it was back at the time when I was feeling that there were ghosts in that house in Monterey or Pacific Grove. Um, and I had an experience that, um, that I was in Chalandak and Bapa was there and he was talking to people and I was sitting on the floor adjacent to him but the, you know I was kind of just tucked away in the corner and after a while he he motioned that I should come up and I sat in his lap and mm, so he told I don't know it was something like just go to sleep and these just go to sleep you're going to be 
fine. These things won't bother you anymore. And so I did. I slept really well. And when I woke up, I, I could feel what the fabric of his shirt was like and what his, it, it, it really felt like I was actually there. Do you have any more experiences with the ghosts or anything like that after that? It, it, you know, it eventually went away uh, as I got, uh, as I got more grounded. Yeah, I, I'm not sure if it went away after that right away, but eventually it stopped bothering me. And I learned to stop talking about it. I used to tell people about it and I could see they were uneasy and I learned to just stop giving it any energy at all. Just let it, don't think about it, don't talk about it, let it be. Probably a good idea. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So any other things happening around Papak when on um, his visits or anything like that? Hmm. Not right. I can't think of anything else. I mean, I we I did I did. Oh yeah, here's another one. We went to Chilandak, and uh, when they the time when they that big Congress when they built the uh, the houses, the long houses, you know, and yeah. all those bamboo long houses, and we all had these little bedrooms off to the side. Yeah. And I was um, my roommate was Halima Polk, and. Uh, and then uh, one time Bapa was coming to inspect, <laughs> to walk through the longhouses and just kind of see how everything was, you know. And I remember we got it all tidied up and, and I, I uh, and I, here he came and I just jumped down to see him, you know, I was like a little kid. And it was just a very happy time. That was really great. That Congress was really nice. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I have a bunch of pictures of that inspection tour. Oh, do you? Right, yeah. right, right, right. It was great. Yeah, I just jumped down, but I think I looked like a little girl when he laughed, you know. <laughs> anyway. So any other things you'd like to talk about or other experiences? Mm -hmm. I can't, I, you know, I didn't like think about it ahead of time. Um, but the main thing is, so we've moved here to Central California and it, it's been a, a kind of a, I've been here for 20 years, but it, it, and right now we've just moved into a retirement home which is really very nice and affordable and kind of not fancy, but it is a, uh, but it's run by Mennonites. And when I was trying to get in, because I could see we really needed to move out of the, move down from the mountains and get closer to civilization so that we're closer to doctors and it was way too much driving. So I found this place, which I had heard about through people that lived up where I was before. And um, we've only been here about three weeks. And I was pretty nervous about, uh, hey, we're Muslim. <laughs> not only are we not Mennonite, we're not even Christian. Uh, you know, how's this gonna go over? So I, I uh, and when I'm filling out the form, it said, um, who is your pastor and what church do you go to? And then somewhere else it was, well, what is your religion? So uh, I happen to know the person that, uh, that we bought the cabin from that's next to our house, that is our, our uh, Airbnb or actually VRBO. It's our vacation rental, right? We bought that cabin from somebody that used to run this very same place, Sierra View. That's how I knew about it. So, so that was interesting. 
And I still, he's passed on, but she lives in Kansas. And so I, I emailed her and I said, Alita, um, what about this? Okay, they want to know my pastor in my church. I'm in Subud, and she knew something about it because I knew her from living there, living next to her. Um, what should I do? What should I put down for my religion? And she said, well, well Subud's not a religion. Just put no specific religion. So I did. And then I crossed my fingers because I wasn't sure we were going to get in. And I wasn't sure um, how I was going to handle it anyway. If I did get in, do I have to hide out? Do I have to pretend? I, I, I was like, what? And I'm not good at that. And um, do I have to eat pork? And um, <laughs> stuff like that. So anyway, so I... Um, it was interesting because when I signed up, when I went to make the final thing, uh, the lady, I think Alita might have called the lady in charge because uh, when the lady in charge was having me sign things, she made a big point of saying that they are non-denominational. They don't, they don't do that. You don't have to, to be anything to, to live here. So uh, that was really good. And um, Anyway, so that was, uh, that was reassuring. And then we moved here and um, uh, so we've been here for three weeks and lo and behold, because I can't keep my mouth shut, um, I ended up, oh, somebody wanted to know about our names. Mm. So I said, well, actually, you know, I ended up telling them um, about Subud and about Islam and about Ramadan. And I explained why I was in Islam and why uh, the benefit from fasting. And um, that was very freeing to be able to say that and, and to be genuinely explaining that it's very valuable because it teaches you never complain I mean, it teaches you to find out who you really are. <laughs> Sharif, you're like a ghost walking behind me, honey. Anyway, so um, it was very good. And it was very freeing to do that. And now I just, whatever I really feel, I'll just go ahead and tell them that. And it doesn't seem to be a problem. Basically, you know, if, 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 if a person is happy and if they accept everybody, People don't really care, you know? And so I, I'm finding like, again, today I was talking, well, they make the, yeah, I'm sit, we're sitting with different people at dinner. There's a free dinner and you're supposed to show up. And at this point, free sounds really good to me. So we're showing up. And if there's pork, <laughs> I just don't eat it. It doesn't matter. All of it just doesn't matter. People don't care. If you, if you love them and they can tell and you're not, and you listen to them and you're kind, it, all that stuff just doesn't even matter. Yeah. They're not going to care. So that's that. They're sweet people. You know, I thought this, uh, I don't want to live with old people, but I don't belong here. That kind of thing. You know, what is this? Why, that's not me. What? Um, but, uh, you know, they're all, they've got good stories. They have a lot of good stories. There's a lot, there's a lot there to know. And, um, you just kind of go with it and, and, and rejoice like, okay. So Sharif has to be, you know, like in a walker or whatever, you know what? Half of the people are in walkers and the other half are pushing them or wheelchairs or whatever. And it's very freeing because, um, yeah, you just accept it and, and uh, keep on going. And then I, I do say to myself, okay, so Sophia, you're telling me you're too young to, to live here, but I'm about to turn, what, 77. So I think I'm not too young to live there. There's such, you know, the main thing is joy. That's what Subud has brought. 
It's just joy. You know what? Just absolute joy. Yeah. And and uh, and actually, I find that um, it's really easy for me to do lighting on here. You know, I, I'm doing it like in my room and it's quite nice. Uh, I really like it. We have a lovely apartment. It's on the third floor. It's got big windows and you can see the mountains from here. It's quite nice. Yeah. Now we have, because we had to move so fast, we, our, our furniture is basically card tables and arrow beds because we, we, we can't get our furniture out yet because it's been snowing still up there. <laughs> I have no more questions, but if you have anything else you'd like to say. I feel like I talk too much. Um, uh, let me see. No, I just would like to say that uh, I'm so grateful for all the uh, all these wonderful years. Yeah. For the gift of Subud, it's a very big deal. Yeah. It's very big. Yeah. That's it. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for telling your story. Thank you for asking. And for the and for doing this work. Yeah. I'm gonna stop Thanks, Rachman. That's good. Yeah, <laughs> Allah.